Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your host, Bob Tremblay. I'm a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, the president of Michigan's Warren Astronomical Society, and an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. This podcast comes from a recording of one of our monthly full moon meetups with the Vatican Observatory staff and Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Sacred Space Astronomy is the Vatican Observatory's online community. We have several astronomers and scholars who write articles on our website about astronomy, space science, and faith in science. Every full moon, the Vatican Observatory Foundation hosts a Zoom meetup for our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Typically, our guest will be a member of the Vatican Observatory staff or an affiliated researcher, and they'll tell us about the research they're doing and the journey that led them to the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy Consolmanio, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, will typically talk with our guest, and our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers can ask them questions. This podcast was taken from the Full Moon Meetup on Tuesday, December 26, 2023. Our guest was Brother Bob Mackey, SJ, Curator of Meteorites at the Vatican Observatory and member of the mission teams for the OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission and the Lucy Mission to the Trojan Asteroids. Brother Bob was a guest for one of our podcasts back in 2022 titled The Stuff of Stars. He's been a little busy since then. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. A little little background of uh, what I do. All right. I am a Jesuit brother, and I am the curator of meteorites at the Vatican Observatory, so I have the job that Brother Guy used to have before he got demoted to become director of the observatory. And uh, <laughs> and so so now I, I control the laboratory, and he can't, he's not allowed in there anymore. And uh, so, so my job as curator involves, of course, taking care of the meteorite collection, of which we have about 1,200 specimens. Uh, and also making them available for research loans and and trying to uh, to uh, grow the collection by uh, mostly through through donations, occasional purchases, but not not that often. So then on the research side of things, I study uh, physical properties of meteorites and extraterrestrial materials. Uh, and that's work that uh, I originally got into through, again, through Brother Guy when I was uh, a Jesuit in formation studying philosophy. Uh, one summer I was looking for something to do while classes were out of session. Uh, I asked Guy if he knew of anything I might look into and he said, hey, come to Rome and work with me. And so I got introduced to the research that he does and then eventually that became my PhD work at the University of Central Florida. Uh, I've studied uh, the physical properties that are density, porosity, and magnetic susceptibility for a few thousand, I think probably close to 2,000 meteorites at this point. I had collections all over the place. I was actually born in Fort Worth, but uh, left the city as a, as a baby. I was a, an Air Force brat. And the first time I was back there was when I was a grad student at, at UCF doing the research. And I uh, went back there to, to do research on the Monet collection. That was one of the collections that I studied for my, for my PhD. One of the things about the work that I do is uh, because I've done it so much, I've sort of gained a reputation as sort of the expert on in measuring meteorite density and porosity. And so these days, people come to me with uh, specimens that they, that they need that measurement for because they, they know I'll do a good job with it. And a lot of my, the work that I do is in collaboration with people who are studying meteorites for other reasons and they want to know the porosity. And that has led to to my involvement with, with the space missions, uh, in particular with OSIRIS-REx. Originally, the, the person who's in charge of the uh, physical and thermal property working group was consulting with me, asking about you know how to do these measurements, uh, what kind of specifications we need for the uh, device to do the measurements. And, and eventually he just kind of said, uh, why, why don't you just join the team? Uh, and so uh, asked me to actually lead the uh, the design and construction of a, an ideal gas pycnometer to be used for the uh, specimens that came back from the asteroid Bennu. When did that actually um, happen? How long ago was that? Sometime uh, 2022, I want to say, was, no, 2021, 20, 20, I think, was, was when uh, I was asked to join the team. Um, so... It was one of the uh, things it, during the pandemic, I was doing very little work because everybody else was doing very little work. Um, and, uh, and, and so 
uh, once uh, I was asked to uh, to kind of um, get involved in this, I, I just really jumped on it because it was it was something to to really do uh, that really kind of got me up in the morning at a time when I had very little else going on. So, so people have been building picnometers to these gizmos that measure a volume using gas for oh, a long time. What's different about yours? Well, uh, actually, the picnometers are are relatively recent uh, in uh, the overall history of, of science. The, the earliest one that I can find reference to is the 1950s. Uh, now, maybe they were existing before, but um, uh, people really... Okay, well, what is a picnometer? Explain briefly so, what so the, It uses the ideal gas law. Um, and so you have two chambers of known volumes, and you stick your specimen in one chamber, and... Uh, and pressurize it. And you've got a, a gauge that'll let you measure that pressure. And then you open a valve that'll let the gas expand into the second chamber. So that volume expands. And by the ideal gas law, as the volume expands, the pressure drops. So you're changing your pressure. You measure the new pressure. And by comparing the original pressure and the new pressure and doing some calculations that any first year physics student can do, you can calculate the volume displaced by the specimen. And that yeah, volume yeah. becomes the volume for density, which is mass divided yeah. by volume. Yeah, and it's a particular kind of density, what we call grain density, which is the, the density of the solid component because the gas penetrates into the interior and fills the voids. So the only part that's displaced is the, the solid part, the, the part that's actual rock. And it's important uh, we can compare that with the what we call the bulk volume and bulk density, uh, which we use a laser scanner at, uh, at Castel Gandolfo for. Uh, so you basically just scan the outside of the specimen and create a shape model in the computer and you measure the volume of that model. So that captures everything on the inside, both the rock and the empty space is part of that model. So the difference between the two is the amount of empty space, is the, is the porosity. So what's the difference between the one that you built in Boston College a few years ago or the one you can buy from a shop, and the one that you've built for NASA? Well, the one I built for NASA was designed specifically to maintain what we call curation pristinity. In other words, it, it had to meet all of the standards for preventing uh, any additional contamination that uh, would not have been introduced by the minimum requirements of the mission. It, it had to be built out of very specific materials that were curation approved, had to not include any unapproved materials, and it had to be installed in a glove box at, at the uh, OSIRIS-REx uh, clean room at, at NASA Johnson Space Center. It actually, there's two parts. There's, there's the part that goes into the glove box, which just contains the sample and expansion chambers. And then there's all the plumbing and everything, uh, and the, the valves, the solenoid valves and stuff, which by having them located outside the glove box, it allowed us to uh, relax some of the constraints so that, for instance, the wiring and stuff didn't have to be fully compliant. But every everything that's in the gas path, everything that connects through the, the gas path to the specimen or to the glove box had to conform to all the requirements. And the gas we use, by the way, is the same uh, nitrogen that they use in the glove box itself. We take it straight from the same feed. Even the gas is, is nothing that isn't already there. And then in other words, you just basically, the only thing that uh, is coming through are the, the, the pipes where the gas comes out and all the meters are outside the glove box. Yeah, Was all that the meters, kind of, all the electronics. I'm thinking building this thing, all I can picture is, you know, the guys building a, a ship in a bottle. You had to construct this in such a way that you could have it put together inside the glove box. Was that trivial? It, it was not trivial. In fact, uh, the... <laughs> The way we designed it is uh, on the side of the glove box, there are little four inch portholes that are used. You, uh, there, there's a big plate that goes on the porthole that normally you would take and, uh, and put electrical connectors or whatever for whatever's inside through. And so we, we designed the pictometer to go through one of these things. So everything on the inside had to fit through this four inch diameter hole. Uh, that's one of the reasons why everything on the outside, uh, you know, there's so much else is on the outside. I have a great video showing the installation of it on my YouTube channel. So I think this is a good time to plug the YouTube channel. But uh, but I have a whole series on the building of this pycnometer um, and the 
The last part of the series actually has footage of the installation at NASA Johnson Space Center. So you can kind of where, see how it fits through this little hole. Where physically were the pieces built? Where the did the pieces, parts come from um, and, and how did they put them together? So a lot of the stuff was sourced from manufacturers, but there were a few structural elements that we had to design and build ourselves. We designed them here at in, in Arizona, in Tucson. Uh, so I've been working through the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona, which is the headquarters of OSIRIS-REx. The, the machining of, of several of the structural components at machine shops on campus and elsewhere around Tucson. But all of those things were kept separate. They were not assembled until they were sent to Johnson Space Center. So each individual component was cleaned separately. And they, they have this whole process of super cleaning them and sterilizing them and everything to make sure there's nothing on them. They're especially concerned about having organic material on them because one of the goals of OSIRIS-REx is to study uh, building blocks of life. And if you have stuff from around here. Uh, like your them, fingerprint. Then, uh, it, like a fingerprint or, well, fingerprints are, are the least of the worries. Uh, there's just so much stuff that, but so, so everything had to be autoclaved to kill off any organics, cleaned and sterilized. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm not even going to go through all the details. And then it was actually physically assembled uh, inside the clean room at Johnson Space Center. Now, I was not able to do that myself because I actually had to renew my Italian residency permit. So I spent the entire summer uh, last summer in Italy. So I returned to Italy in mid-March and submitted the paperwork. And I picked up the residency permit about two weeks before OSIRIS-REx landed in September. It took the entire summer just to do that process. Meanwhile, all of the, the assembly and stuff had to be done by my colleague at, at University of Arizona, uh, Andy Ryan. And so I wrote up instructions on how to assemble it. Um, I made a computer model of the whole thing with all every individual component. And I used the computer model to show how to assemble it. <laughs> and, but, uh, but you have been to Houston. You have been to the place where it is assembled, I, right? I have. So so after OSIRIS-REx landed, uh, or after the capsule arrived, so I have to I have to specify. So so the spacecraft itself passed by the Earth and dropped off the the uh, the capsule with the specimen. So the capsule came to the Earth, but the spacecraft continued on and it's it's in an extended mission right now. Uh, they've renamed it Osiris Apex and is heading off to uh, eventually rendezvous with the uh, uh, asteroid Apophis. Um, now it's not going to collect any specimens because it's already uh, used up that part of the mechanism, but uh, it'll it'll uh, go visit Apophis and take some pictures and and get a lot of data. So you're going to go to Houston and you're going to go work in this gizmo. Walk us through what you have to go through to get from your hotel into the room with this clean box. Okay, so from the hotel, you go through the front gate or through a gate at NASA Johnson Space Center. You need to have a, a proper badge for that. So you ha how did you get the badge? I had to submit documents and stuff in advance. And, and they, uh, when I showed up, they had the badge waiting for me. Well, they, they made the badge on site, but they had all the information already waiting for me. Okay. And, and my badge, it's a year-long badge as opposed to the usual visitor passes uh, just for, for a few days because of the fact that I intend to be going back a few times. So then you go in and you go to the Astro Materials Curation Facility, uh, which is where they have the Antarctic Meteorite Collection, where they have the Stardust materials, where they have the, the Stardust was another space mission. Uh, they have a few uh, things from Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. The, the Japanese missions are stored there. And of course, the Apollo moon rocks are in that facility as well. So you go in the building, and assuming you're going into the clean room, you go upstairs to where the clean room is, you walk into an ante room. And so the ante room, first off, it has one of those sticky mats on the floor that picks up all the dust off the bottom of your shoes. You step on the sticky mat and then you put little booties at little, there's these little plastic foot coverings that you put over your shoes. So before you can step off the sticky mat, you have to have one of those on. And you go and you put on a smock, a clean dust resistant smock and a head covering 
And if you have a beard like me, you have to put on a beard covering and gloves. And then anything you're bringing in has to get wiped down. And there's only a few things. So like my ring, I would not be able to bring in my ring. Uh, any jewelry has to stay out. If you bring in a cell phone, because we, we do use cell phones for documentation of stuff, I have to take the case off and have just the cell phone without the case. And that all gets wiped down with a, a special wipe. And you go through an airlock into the next chamber. And in the next chamber, you actually change clothes again. You put on a full bunny suit. So it's a onesie that goes from legs all the way up to the neck. There's a hood that goes over. I forgot to mention there's a there's a full face mask and you new set of gloves that have to, to go over your sleeves to make sure everything's good and sealed. And booties that are full boots that kind of wrap around the leggings. The only part of you that is exposed is the eyes. <laughs> Everything else is covered. Do you have to have your glasses cleaned? I usually do clean the glasses, but that's not required. My bushy eyebrows tend to brush up against the glasses and make them kind of messy. So I. This know. is not something you can dash in and do in, in a minute and a half. No, uh, especially since you never do it alone. I suppose the curation staff could do it alone, but we always have to be accompanied by the curation staff. We don't just walk in there. In fact, I don't so, have the, the kind of badge that would even let me through the door. So you're a, a man on a mission, as it were. You're in the Osiris Rex mission, but you're on another mission as well. Can you tell us about this other NASA mission? So the Lucy mission, it, it's not a sample return mission. It's a, um, it's a go out there and explore mission, but it's, it's going to visit, um, uh, its main mission is to visit the Trojan asteroids. So there's a, a set of asteroids that are in the Lagrange point that are that at the same distance in their orbit as Jupiter. So they have the same AU, the same semi-major axis as, as Jupiter in their orbit, but they're 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind Jupiter. And those are those are sort of stable points in, in the orbit. The gravitational interaction between Jupiter and the sun holds them into to that location and keeps them from straying away. What is believed is that there's a number of asteroids that were trapped in there in the early days of the solar system, that most of the asteroids of those kinds ejected through gravitational interaction with Jupiter. Jupiter kind of threw away a lot of the early asteroids. Most The asteroids that we have remaining in the solar system is just a tiny fraction of what originally was there. We think there's some kinds of asteroids that Jupiter otherwise would have ejected, were trapped in this resonance at the Lagrange points and are among the population of Trojan asteroids. So we're, the mission is specifically intends to visit the six targets, but in fact, the number has grown because several of the targets were determined to be binaries. And then also on the way out, there are targets of opportunity. So the asteroid Dinkinesh, which is a, uh, a main belt asteroid, and then the asteroid Donald Johansson is another main belt asteroid. So we just, in November, past Dinkinesh, and it was just a flyby, go back and take a nice photos, get some good data. It was sort of a test of the systems. It was it was not a high science encounter, but we discovered that Dinkinesh itself is a binary, and we discovered that the the binary, the, the, uh, the small satellite, uh, is also itself a contact binary. It has two lobes that are that are in contact with each other. So again, to give people a sense of what it's like to be on one of these missions, you've been on, involved in the Lucy mission for how many years now? So my old thesis advisor, Dan Britt, is the working group lead for the interior and bulk properties working group. For, so it's basically to try to understand the, the overall density and internal structure of the asteroids that are encountered. So he asked me to join the mission I want to say 2018 or so, 2019, somewhere, okay. somewhere like that. Uh, so I don't about know. five years ago. Because he's looking towards his own retirement. So he asked me to basically fill in for him as he moves towards retiring. Right. Uh, so when when is Lucy going to get to its targets? A few more years. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking I, about 2030, right? Yeah, it's it's going to be a while. The, the been... encounter with Dinkinesh was just a, a month ago. Uh, the encounter with Donald Johansson is a year from now. So it'll, it'll be 12 than... years or so of being on this mission. And what do you do in the meanwhile? 
What do I do what does, on the mission? Yeah, what, do, what does being on the mission mean for you? Attending a lot of telecons, to be honest. <laughs> yep, yep. Usually um, at times of the day, not convenient for Rome. Uh, yeah, and sometimes not convenient for here either. So <laughs> I've been on telecons at six o'clock in the morning. I've been on telecons. Because the thing is, these are international missions, and they try to schedule them to try to catch as many people as possible. And so, How many scientists are on which, this mission? Oh, goodness. I don't know. A, lo a lot. <laughs> a lot. You know, more, more than so, five or ten. We're talking more than 15. Five, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. The The next science team meeting for Lucy is scheduled for the spring. And they are contemplating whether the venue they've got for it can, can work because it's got a limited number of seats. They're thinking it can work if most of the, the team is attending online as, as virtual presence. And, and only the, the uh, Southwest research people are actually physically present. So these are big, complicated, to use a word that people know, nobody likes to hear, political. You have to have a way of figuring out how to get all of these people to be working at the same direction at the same time. Yes. For each mission, there is quite a bit of structure. So for instance, for the OSIRIS-REx mission, I actually recently was, was uh, named a deputy working group lead for these uh, sample physical and thermal analysis working group. So I'm a deputy working group lead. There's the group itself contains 20 something people or more. I forget what the number was at last count. And that's just um, for this one kind of measurement. Yeah, and that's just for people who are doing physical and thermal analysis of the specimens themselves. So that doesn't include the organic analysis. It doesn't include the, the composition. It's just like heat capacities and densities and strengths, things like that. So there's the working group lead, Dr. Andy Ryan. And then there's several working groups, each with their own working group leads. And they are coordinated by the mission sample scientist, who is Harold Connolly. And then he interacts with the curation group, which is at NASA Johnson Space Center, and that's headed by Nicole Lunning and Francis McCubbin, who's the head of curation at NASA. And then they have their own separate crew that they coordinate. And then all of that gets sort of under the, the auspices of the principal investigator, Dante Loretta, and his crew. That's all the sample science part of it. Then you also have the mission science team, the people who actually did the science during the spacecraft operations. So they're an entirely different set of people that were doing the observations as the spacecraft orbited Bennu and took the data. And then you have the engineering people, the Lockheed Martin and, and all those people, they all have their different structure. And of course, you have NASA headquarters kind of making sure everything is operating. So along it's... with this and how many other missions going on all at the same time? It's oh, quite yeah, because you have several missions. So you have, you know, you have OSIRIS-REx and now OSIRIS-APEX, which, by the way, has a different PI. So, so Dante Loretta kind of passes the baton to a different person who is in charge of that mission. And she has her own crew. And then you have... Well, let's see. Right now, you've got the Lucy mission going on. You've got Psyche. Um, those are just the asteroid missions, yeah. Those are just the asteroid missions. You still have active people working on Voyager. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Which was got, launched when I was an undergraduate. Then there's the space telescopes. You've got James Webb and all those other things. I mean, right. there's, yeah, a lot of science going on in space these days. Yeah. There is one question that I know you can't answer, but I want to hear you give the official <laughs> answer that you can give, because somebody has typed in, have you seen any results that ended with an ooh, that's interesting moment? Have I seen any results that end in an ooh, that's interesting moment? Well, when we got the initial data back on what's called the quick look sample, so when they open up the canister that contains the sample collection unit, what's called the tag sam head. So that the tag sam head went into this sealed canister, and that sealed canister went into the the space capsule. So you sort of have these different layers of ceilings. The space capsule returned to the Earth. At Utah, they opened up the capsule to reveal the canister, which then they wrapped up all nice and tight and clean and, and brought that to NASA and then started operations on the canister. When they opened up the canister, there was material from Bennu inside the canister that was it just kind of stuff that uh, that the tag sam head had sort of picked up or had fallen out of the tag sam head, whatever, 
So that was not inside the collection unit, but was still good sample from Bennu that had been sealed all the whole time. And so this material, they collected up, I want to say something like 100 milligrams of material that they then distributed to laboratories. And this was part of the original sample analysis plan, was to do this, this quick look on, on this stuff. And got back a lot of quick data on things like huge number of phyllosilicates, suggesting quite a bit of water trapped. So these are hydrated minerals with quite a bit of water trapped into their crystalline structure. A reasonably high carbon content, uh, the somewhat unusually high, not absurdly high, but it definitely uh, is higher than than you normally find in most meteorites. Uh, so about uh, close to 5% carbon. These sort of results are like, ooh and ah. The big ooh for us was, in fact, when we finally uh, got some specimen out of the tag Zem head. And there's one rock. It's uh, It's about an inch on a side. And that one rock all by itself was more material than had ever been returned by from asteroid missions before. So, <laughs> so yeah. brother Bob, well, I gotta know how long is it gonna be before I'm able to get a tiny chunk of asteroid in lucite? <laughs> is that ever going to happen in my lifetime? Uh, you can buy one for yourself. For you to get a chunk of asteroid in lucite, it will require a private mission. A privately funded mission, not a government mission. And for that to happen, we need to get the space program, the private space programs up to the point where they really are able to to go out to asteroids, which is a very expensive and challenging thing. So I, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but for it to happen as a, as a private venture, you would need a good business model. And I'm not really sure what the motive for just going out to an asteroid and picking yeah, up some rocks. Yeah, yeah, Bob wanting an asteroid piece ain't going to get an asteroid, <laughs> private asteroid mission. No. I was just going to mention to Bob Tremblay, as you sort of mentioned, Guy, is that I can give him a piece of an asteroid when he comes here. It's called the meteorite. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> we don't know where it came from. It's, it's a lot of things that come cheap. You don't ask where it came from. Well, yeah. there is something that you know is... where they came from. So this is true. So I do want to I do want to comment on that real quick. Is that a, a meteorites provide a lot of great asteroidal material, and also you know you have some some meteorites from Mars, some from the Moon. So it's a great cheap man's uh, sample return mission uh, is is meteorites. The thing is, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't survive atmospheric entry, and you also lack a lot of context. You know, we know that something came from Mars. But we don't know what part of Mars it came from. We know something came from asteroids. We don't know which asteroids. Uh, <laughs> and and so to have the actual context of going somewhere and picking stuff up is also very valuable for providing the necessary context to, to let us know uh, what information we have and what information we don't have in the meteorites. They are also probably contaminated by Earth's atmosphere within minutes of arrival. And that's one of the reasons why we're so very careful with the OSIRIS-REx stuff. Because as soon as the stuff is exposed to the air, you know, if you're trying to study amino acids or, or other organic stuff, your study is useless at that point. As soon as it's exposed to the air, it's mm. it's bad data. And I'll, I'll end with the famous story of the Lost City Meteorite, <laughs> one of the first ones that was actually seen to fall through a, a camera system. And they realized that it had fallen on the snows of a road in remote Oklahoma near the town of Lost City. And they rushed out there to collect it. They could see that the road was covered with snow and no other vehicle had been anywhere near this rock. And they could see the black rock in the center of the road. And when they got to the rock, they discovered a set of dog tracks and the snow on and around the meteorite was yellow. So don't do that to the Osiris-Rex samples. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Bob, for being part of this. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next full moon. Until then, keep looking right, up. Then. Ciao. A quick afterthought. In January of 2024, I was in Tucson for the Vatican Observatory's Acme workshop, where I got to meet Brother Bob Mackey in person. He was filming his stop-motion Galileo video, which is actually pretty cool. We'll link to it in the description. While I was at the Acme workshop, Larry Lebowski did indeed give me, and the other attendees, a meteorite. That's a wrap for this podcast. The audio editor for this podcast was myself, Bob Chumbly. 
You can listen to our other podcasts and read our posts on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. If you'd like to attend our full moon meetups and talk with our guests live, join our Sacred Space Astronomy community, also at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone!